Can we please give a round of applause to all the speakers yesterday? How great was that content? I hope you guys were able to tune in. Um, awesome. I am Natasha. I'm a product designer on the Fig Jam team. So it was so great to see some of my fellow teammates yesterday talk a little bit more about the behind the scenes of designing for delight in Fig Jam. Um, big shout out to them. I also really loved how Kian broke down how he, he and the team built the photo booth widget, the high five feature. A lot of these really fun tools are so great to use on Fig Jam. I want to see a raise of hands of how many of you have tried those tools out on Fig Jam. OK, some of you. Great if you haven't already. Please test them out. They're great, a great way to make your meetings a lot more fun. Um, and speaking of fun tools, if this session was a Fig Jam board right now, you'd see me rage shake my cursor to wave at everyone who is physically here, but also to the everyone attending virtually. There's a bunch of you, so there's so much in store for today, and I'm so excited that you're all here. Um, let me move it on. Um, raise your hand, actually, if this is your first config. Oh, oh, there's a lot of you. Okay, amazing. Um, it's a really special one this year, so I'm grateful that I get to experience this with all of you since a big part of what makes this event so fun is you. You mingling, you seeing all the new features, you making new friends, that's the best part. Um, this is not my first config, but it is my first in real life config and also my first time hosting at config. So I'm so stoked about all the talks and it's gonna be such a treat. So please, can we keep this energy going? Yes, awesome. Um, as you explore and make your way around config for day two, um, we encourage you to share all your photos, all your videos on social with hashtag config2023. Um, please share it on Twitter, Instagram, whatever apps you use today, TikTok, Snapchat, Be Real, any, I don't even know if they use hashtags on Be Real, but <laughs> share them where you can. Um, on stage next, we have Candy Williams, who is Bumble's director of content. She's come from Bristol, uh, in the United Kingdom, and is the author of four books and counting. If you find her around in config, be sure to ask her about tarot reading and her colorful kicks. I can't wait to find out more about the better partnerships that can be built between product designers and content folks. Without further ado, please welcome Candy. You're gonna do great. Oh my gosh, so many people. Thank you very much for having me. Um, and be warned, I'm the clumsiest person in the world. So if a crystal pings and hits you, sorry, or you're welcome, depending on your vibe. <laughs> So who am I? So as we said, day to day, I'm director of content design at Bumble, but I've been a language nerd for as long as I can remember. I spent many years studying the psychology and sociology of language. Sometimes I write books like this one up here. And when I'm not doing that, you will most likely find me clutching my crystals, shuffling my tarot cards and listening to Lizzo. And introductions are hard, right? Especially when you're a content person at a design conference. So I did what any utmost professional would do and asked ChatGPT how I should introduce myself. And it said a lot of things as it often does, but it told me that I should introduce myself by saying, so dear designers, prepare to embark on a transformative expedition where the symphony of words harmonizes with the canvas of design. Let us explore how the right word placed with intention can illuminate the path to innovation, cultivate deeper connections and ignite the imagination of those who witness the remarkable fusion of language and design. Ooh. So it left me with pretty big boots to fill, but I'll do my best. And as a wordsy type person, you're probably expecting me to stand up here and talk a lot about this kind of thing. No, not grandmas, but commas, punctuation, grammar, that sort of thing. Or on a day like today, you're thinking I might be debating whether this guy is gonna take our jobs or not. It's not, but that's not what I'm gonna talk about. Or this, which is what most people think we spend all of our time doing, tone and voice, right? But the reality is, all of those things are really just a part of what we do as content designers and UX writers. 
So what I wanted to do is delve into a little bit more of the depth and breadth of our role and how what we do is so much more than just being a palatable replacement for Laura Ipsum. <laughs> so what are we going to talk about then? Well, it's going to be in three parts. So I wanted to talk about language beyond the words and how it's a system for expression, meaning, business success and so much more. And then let's get practical and talk about how to involve words people in the process. And of course, I know there's going to be people in here that don't have any content designers or UX writers on their team. So we'll talk about that too and what to do if you don't have any people to work with. And please, please do not worry if you're sat in this room because you couldn't get into one of the other ones thinking, what on earth is a content designer? That's fine. I understand that there's people in different camps here. And we might have people that are pretty new to the concept of content design or UX writing altogether. Welcome. And I really hope we've got some people in here that feel a bit like this, so are excited about UX writing but just haven't had the opportunity to work with UX writers or content designers yet. And then no doubt <laughs> there are some of these people, some words enthusiasts, some people who know a thing about language or two themselves. Great, we love to see it. And then I know there's some of my people, my UX writing and content design crew in here, which is wonderful to see. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> and it's kind of interesting, right, because We've actually spoken a lot more about UX writing in recent years. Content design was one of the fastest growing job titles on LinkedIn last year. But all too often, when we talk about design, we focus on this kind of thing, layouts, components, etc. But in reality, without language and good, clear content, this is how user experiences land. They're not quite so easy to navigate or understand, is it? Or this, it's kind of hard to know what you're filling out, right? <laughs> and this, it's not easy to find your people, find love and make connections without good, clear content. Language is much more than just words. It's a system that helps people make sense of their experience. And the work that we do as content people really focuses on the intentional design of that language. But why should you even care about it, all right? Well, let's get into it. It's interesting because how we design content for digital experience is a lot different than if we're designing or creating content for a novel or a zine or such like. Because typically, online, people are digesting content in one of two ways. They're scanning, so they're looking for specific informational cues, such as scanning to find how to add an image on Figma, per se. Or they're skimming just to get a really quick gist and understanding of what something's about. And that's integral to how we design our content. It's a lot more than just making sure things sound all right. And none of this is new age kind of UX writing speak or content design jargon. Linguistics and social linguistics, which is how language shapes how we see the world and vice versa, and psycholinguistics, how language shapes how people think, feel, what they do, has been around for decades. So as we go through, I wanted us to think a little bit broader, a little bit beyond just the basics. And it's really interesting because when we talk about content design, the assumption is that a lot of our work is focused in this inner section here, so morphology, so just the words. But there's so much more to it. And if we start there, morphology is really about those words themselves, how they're used, their relationship to other words. So if you look at Figma, lovely word, beautiful, well placed, <laughs> a noun. It's grammatical makeup you can see here. But this is really just a little area of where we focus. And if we go beyond the words, so let's look at syntax, the structure and order of our word choices. And let's take these two headings. So they're on the very same topic, but the structure and their syntax is very different. And you can see with this one here, it really puts the emphasis on the actor, and it's not till later down the line that you get to know what it's really about, who it's really about, ChatGPT, OpenAI, and what they've done. 
But then if you flip it round here, you see it's the same story again, but a very, very different syntax, a different order, and the emphasis is very different. It's putting the focus up front on ChatGPT, and it's using words like underpaid, exploited, and you can see how just that shift in syntax gives a very different emphasis, which can arouse different feelings in people. And the same goes for our UX writing. We've been talking a lot about new tools. But you know, a lot of what we do is actually thinking about how do we structure our words, not just the words that we choose. Like with this example, you could go with something like with our new self-expression tool. You can share GIFs and stickers you think are cool. Or with a simple restructure, you can see here you're leading, you're inviting people to share cool GIFs and stickers. Same sentiment, but a very different syntax. And the same goes for the old payment processing error. We don't love to see them. But there's many different ways, again, that you can say something like this. But each has a really different feeling. So the beginning, you know, the first one is very passive. This payment cannot be processed. But you can see with the second one, you add a personal pronoun. And it really makes it a lot clearer who's taking responsibility. It gives that bit more detail. Or you could just throw it right back to the old school. Payment processing error, which doesn't really tell people a lot, right? And maybe I'm salty, but I had to include this one. It says a lot more about me, I'm sure, but I'm often being beeped at, told that I didn't close my fitness ring today. And there is a simple reframe that would be a little bit less blamey. Maybe it's a me problem. But again, you can see how structure matters. And then if we go a bit broader, so semantics, and here's where it gets a bit juicy. Semantics is about the meaning of our word choices. And take these guys, and disclaimer, I've deliberately picked a divisive one. Because I know, which blows my mind, I only found out in a Mexican restaurant that you call this arugula. But for us, they're both rocket. Wild, huh? <laughs> so silly example, maybe. But you can see, meaning it has cultural context. There's a lot to it. And one here is a lot tastier and cheaper than the other. <laughs> and what's really interesting, I don't want to give you all a, a boring linguistics lesson, but when we unpack meaning and how we understand things, our comprehension is largely based on two factors. So how we comprehend words and phrases is generally based on the age in which we learn a word or phrase and how often we use it, right? So let's take this guy. And any Brits in the room will be very familiar with this question. A little while ago for our European Union referendum, we were asked a simple question. Do we want to leave the EU or do we want to remain? in the EU. So let's unpack the language a little bit there. So you've got a word like leave. So based on the model we've just spoken about, leave is a word that we would have learned pretty early on. And it's one that we use quite often. We leave the party, we leave the room, we leave the door open or not if you're in my household. And remain, on the other hand, it's kind of different. We would have learned it later in life, most likely. And it's a static verb instead of a dynamic one. So it's not one that tends to be in our day-to-day -day vocab as often. So if we fricked it a bit, so looking at meaning, synonyms, but very different connotations, different comprehensional contexts. So stay, if we flip that, it's a word that we use a lot more often, one we would have learned a lot earlier. And you can start to see how our language choices play such an important role in resonance, in decision making, in the way that we see the world. And of course, we're at a design conference, so it goes for things like our button copy as well, our UX writing choices. These are the kind of decisions that we're making every day, and by no means on a whim. So skip, later you might see these used synonymously, but skip obviously has dual meaning. It has additional cultural context, considerations in that respect. And confirm and go it. Everyone loves go it right now, don't they? <laughs> so again, similar choices. But it's really important to take into account people's mental models, how familiar they are with these kind of patterns. And a great thing that we can do as designers, as UX writers, is not to take those things for granted, to actually test, to learn. You will always, almost be surprised. And it's important because technically, two words can mean the same thing, but they can say something very different. 
And finally, pragmatics. So this is all about meaning in context. And that context is influenced and shaped by many things, our beliefs, our backgrounds, our lived experiences. And for me, this is where us as content designers spend most of our time. This is where we spend the bulk of our time. And we'll be thinking about many, many things, not just does this need an adverb or not, but we'll be thinking about many pragmatic questions. So what is the cultural connotation of this? How do these words make people feel? We spoke a lot about this this morning with AI, but what is the potential unintended harm of this language? What do they mean in context? And how familiar are people with them? And then if we go a bit deeper with an example like this, so two buttons, things that might be used synonymously, but have very different pragmatic meaning. Asking someone if they understand something is very different than asking them if they accept it. And this is important, right, in the context of our design decisions, when we've got ourselves into a bit of a pickle where we have these really, really lengthy patterns where people scroll through things like privacy policies, terms and conditions, and they're invited just to accept. But have they really understood it? Do they know how their information is going to be used? Do they really know what they're signing up for, what their options are? And you can start to see how when you play with language intentionally, how you make those decisions intentionally, you can encourage understanding and decision making. Another important one, because these words here, they have literal meaning. We get it, so female, male. But when you break it down, that literal meaning is really focused on people's biological sex, their reproductive abilities. So you can start to see how that can be limiting, and you can especially see how options like these are very limiting to gender non-conforming people, gender fluid people, non-binary people. And the issue with this is all you're doing with the other box is you're basically saying if you don't fit into these two camps, then you're othered. And when we think about the pragmatics of othering, it's not great, is it? You're pushing people aside, you're putting them on that side. So you can start to see how patterns like this, historic patterns that have gone on for much time, can be really problematic in context. And if your gender flow looks like that, there's no shade, many do. And I'm not gonna stand up here and tell you that tackling things like gender inclusivity and language is super simple. But I am gonna say it's incredibly worthwhile. And we are in a much more fortunate position than ever where we have wonderful organizations like GLAD, NCTE, Stonewall, who have very gladly and graciously shared information on inclusive terminology that we can draw upon to help us take on these challenges. And I am gonna say that it's not just the language benefit. I've worked on a number of projects like this. And what you tend to see is that if your gender flow does it, something like that, there's thousands of people who aren't able to engage with your experience, who aren't using your product, who aren't buying from you. And the chances are those people will be complaining too. But the good thing about that is the complaints can give you clear framing to tackle and improve the language. Because you can come up with hypotheses like, right, so you've got this many people complaining, if we can update, we can reduce those complaints per se. And what you tend to see is you make those valuable changes Complaints go down, sales and completions go up, and brand reputation goes up. And moreover, on a moral level, we know that trans, non-binary people, the LGBTQ plus community, are being excluded and persecuted at alarming rates. If we say we're gonna be human-centered, that needs to mean all humans and all genders. Thank you. And another one, so we see this kind of thing quite a lot. So again, simple form fills. You've been asked your first name, your last name. You're minding your own business. If you're anything like me, probably in bed, chilling out, watching Selling Sunset on the side. But <laughs> you can see here, Gregory has put his last name in. And they've been told, oops, oops, please enter a valid last name. And when you unpack things like this, you can kind of see how it happens. 
because a lot of the time we're so focused on the happy path that what happens a lot in organisations is then we start to scramble around at the end for error messages and edge cases and they don't get enough time and the respect that they deserve. But the issue is then we end up with things like this. And who are we to suggest that the characters of someone's last name denote whether it's valid or not? So again, you can see, by taking care of our design, by being intentional with our design decisions and the language we use, we can open up our experiences. And the same goes for many, many points on language and race and ethnicity. Like I said, language has a deeper meaning, and that meaning is not always good. Social linguistics is the study of how language shapes how we see the world. It shapes our consciousness, our perception. And through that lens, you can start to see why colorist language, language that denotes white or light as good, pure, safe, and dark or black as unethical, harmful, criminal, is particularly problematic. The good news is, if you look at the cinnamon, synonyms, you start to see that actually, arguably, these are much clearer. Because what is a dark pattern? Surely deceptive pattern is much clearer. Whiteness, blackness could mean many different things to many different people. But we've got clearer alternatives, like allow and deny. Don't get me started on sold down the river. A ridiculous thing. <laughs> But on that note, we often find that language caught up in idiom or metaphor can really harm meaning. It can be problematic. It can create barriers between us and other people. Every word is a choice. And if there's a clearer, non-idiomatic option, let's use it. And why is all of this important? Because the intention that we have, the intention of our words, doesn't always equate the impact. One word, oh, sorry. <laughs> One word could mean nothing to you or I, but it could be extremely harmful to someone else. And that's dependent on our personal context, our lived experiences. And if folks haven't been at the receiving end of racial stereotyping or being excluded because of their gender, then count yourselves as one of the lucky ones but it's on all of us to do our bit to make sure that others aren't too. And I know, I know, I don't want to say PMs, but there's going to be some people in here that are like, what is the business benefit though? Wow, the good news is, these seemingly simple language changes have a real business impact. Take this example of a big travel company, and they had these fairly innocent seeming form labels, company and address. But because of where they were in the flow, they were where they were asking for bank information, people were getting super confused. They weren't knowing whether to put their address and their company or their bank's address, their bank's company, and they were putting their banks in. And what was then happening is when it was getting to credit card verification, they were failing. They were either then going elsewhere, or they were calling up and getting in a loop with customer service. So they unpacked this, got to the detail of it, and amongst other things, made the labels much, much clearer, made the information hierarchy clearer. And by doing so, they started to see $12 million worth of gains. And another really important thing with pragmatics is it goes a lot deeper than just what we say. I've worked on a number of large accessibility projects and it's always super interesting to me because when people talk about accessibility, they're often focused on color contrast or code and that kind of thing. But so much of accessibility is around content. And this is where content people become real superheroes. And you can see this example. There'll be some of us in here that might never see these labels when we're using Spotify. But you can see how they've added hidden labels, ally text, to make the experience much more inclusive. And Figma can be great for this, because it can help us build out files and layouts, which mean that we're not missing these really important alternative text options in our design process. 
accessibility matters and it matters whether we're designing for someone who finds it hard to read someone who's using a screen reader or someone who's juggling holding a baby and trying to complete a task so a framework that i find really useful for this and when we're designing content accessibly is poor perceivable operable understandable and robust this comes directly from WCAG. Perceivable is a really, really good one because often we're focused on, can people see it visually? Can they read it? But actually, perceivable is all about, can they recognize it? Can they perceive the content is there? And some questions that we can ask ourselves as we're designing content in line with this is, how would someone who's blind, deaf or colorblind, or has low vision, like myself, perceive this screen or journey? A good one for a design content conference. Are we relying on visual cues only? Are we over relying on icons and pictures where we need content to be clearer? And in all of this, what alternatives are we providing? How are we addressing labels, alt text, etc.? And operable, so they can perceive it. Okay, great. Can they use it? Many, many experiences now, guilty are focused on swipes, taps, clicks in the experience. But how does that work for people who can't interact in that way? We can ask ourselves, how does it work on voiceover? Are we giving people crystal clear instructions, control and the chance to confirm and change their mind? And is it clear? Let's not get into a links and buttons debate here, but is it clear at least where the links and buttons are taking people? And then understandable. So we've spoken a lot about this one. It's not enough that people can just read or perceive the content. Can they understand it? Is all of the content that we're using simple, everyday language? We're not sneaking in little bits of internal jargon. We know it happens. Are we being clear about what we're asking people for and why we're asking for it? That's a really important one. And how would someone with very low literacy levels understand this? Where might they struggle? How can we make it clearer? And then finally, robust. I don't want to make assumptions, but I imagine there's a lot of us in here, myself included, on our fancy MacBooks and iPhone whatevers. But when we're thinking about the experience, we should be thinking about how they scale across platforms, technologies for people with different broadband strengths, per se. Asking ourselves, would this be compatible for screen readers? Which ones and how? What inputs are we including for things like voice commands? And how would someone understand the information hierarchy if they were using a keyboard only? Because here's the thing, this is important. We're designing for everyone's understanding, whatever their context. And hopefully, that highlights that we do a little bit more than just making Laura Mitzum a bit better, babes. So how do we put it into practice then? How can you work with content people, UX writers on your team? And we've all seen the memes. <laughs> Honestly, I love them. They make me laugh every time. But I do hope we're a little bit beyond this now. We've all been there, maybe just me, but just relentlessly clicking request edit access as your soul slowly destroys. <laughs> but OK, why does this happen? And it happens because this is kind of how the design process looks a lot of the time. We have this lovely, lovely design process, sweet, succulent, juicy design process. And then at the end, Often we have content running in as a superpower at the end, running across many different things, context switching. They're here because someone said, we need copy. We're ready for the copy. We're ready, just tone and voice it. It's nearly done, which we love hearing that. We love it. Um, <laughs> but what we've discussed, though, is if language is about pragmatics, etc., then that model of content design there doesn't really work. But that happens a lot of the time, the model I shared before, because content designers are working across so many different contexts, right? So they're not just focused on one pod. 
And I'm often asked, what would ideal look like? What would an ideal working situation look like for content designers? I'm surprised at how often I'm asked that, actually. But this is what it would look like. So you've got your P, you've got your PMs, you've got your E, you've got your engineers, but your D is a mixture of your UX designers, product designers, and your content designers and UX writers working together in harmony. And no, this isn't a magical utopia. I've worked like this, and I've seen the incredible benefit that it can have on products and experiences. But I'm also not naive enough to think that that happens overnight, or that it's something that everyone can just adapt to. So what can we do in a world where we've got our content design superheroes, context switching? How can we make things work as well as possible between content designers and product designers? Well, one thing I think is a really good idea is having a bit of a story model. And by that, I mean having a strong middle, beginning and end. And the reason the beginning is so important and starting off on the right page is because content can make or break the user experience. It should always help shape it. And this is your time to really define, OK, what are the gnarly problems? How are we going to work together on these? What's the cultural context? How is it going to localize? To really start to unpack that and define how you want to work together. And then middle. Again, important, because we said, right, content designers are saving the day, not just on your project, but on many. So they might not have as much embedded time to focus on this. So that middle part is really important. The progress check-ins, the jams, the times when you're going to come together and work through things. Being intentional about that. And then the end, never to be overlooked, right? This is where things can go horribly, horribly wrong if we don't do this. Because is the content really final? Are you both happy with the designs? Have we missed any of those cheeky little error states that we spoke about before? Our localization call cool about it? How is it transcreating across different languages? Coming together at these three points is critical. And I'm not talking for weeks on end or you know, months long time. But even if you can come together for an hour at a time, it can make all of the difference. And if you take one thing away from this, it's if in doubt about how to work with content designers or US writers, ask. Please, please go and find your UX writers and content designers on your team and ask how best to work together. Ask what meetings they would like to be part of. Ask what some of the challenges they're facing are, some of the challenges you're facing, and how you can come together around those. Defining your collaboration processes is super important. And one way you can use this is you can use just a simple task mapping model. So you can go through, you can brainstorm all of the tasks that you think you might need to do for a project, right? And then you can start to align, OK, who's doing what? You can have leads and supports on different things. And it really helps you to understand, OK, where are we going to go deep and work together? And where might we diverge and converge? So for example, if the product designer is going away and prototyping using the cheeky new variables, then maybe the content designer is working closely with the localization team to understand any gnarly problems in that respect. It's a really nice, simple way to define and get alignment on who's doing what. I couldn't not add this one in. Small but important. Content designers and UX writers can spend a lot of soul-destroying time chasing information from meetings they weren't invited to, meetings they were left off. So one way that you can be really helpful is check those invites. Check with your content design partner if they need to be there. Work out if you're going to play back the information. It can be super helpful, especially when they're spread thinly across different contexts. And that's the biggest part of it all, really. It's partnership. It's championing. For me, the biggest success metric for content design is having more people talk about content design when we're not even in the room. Because of the context switching, being thinly spread, content designers are burning out at alarming rates. So please be a content champion. We really appreciate it. And a practical way you can do that 
imagine a world you've got a leadership or stakeholder meeting and instead of this scenario at the top where it's like oh just ignore that it's placeholder copy ignore it and the poor content designer is like oh, 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 oh. <laughs> instead of that you're handing over to them to talk through their rationale their thinking their ideas the decisions they've made we can make this happen we love to see it and finally I hope now you're all sat here if you don't have words people thinking we need them but we've got some bits for you too don't worry so what can you do if you don't have words people in your team well a great way to scale content design and content knowledge can be design systems we've spoken about them a lot it's so important to consider content design and language as part of your design system good example and there's many out there now they're really coming through but a good example of this is WISE. So WISE, as part of their design system, they have content design embedded in every aspect of it. So I really liked this one for their alert placards, as well as the visual design of their alert placards. They go through for each how you would frame your writing around that, how you would design your content for that. And when we think about pragmatics, that's really important, right? Because if we are telling someone that there's a really serious payment processing error or their card details are wrong, we're going to design that content in a very different way than if it's like, whoa, new feature. So that's a really great example of how we can embed content within our design systems. How do you do that? If you don't have a content designer, I hear you cry. Don't worry. Some of us have already done some of the hard work for you just before the lockdown days when we had a lot of time on our hands. Some of us content people got together and created some evidence-based content patterns on everything from error messages to accessibility to clear language to readability, which you can find open source as part of the readability guidelines. It's a really great starting point just to get an idea for some of the considerations from a content point of view. And now I hope that you're all going to be thinking beyond just the words. You're going to be questioning. You're going to be saying to PMs, but what's the pragmatical meaning of it? So hopefully that gives you some food for thought on things like structure, pragmatics, meaning, etc. OK, back to this guy. <laughs> that's a topical day. No, OK. It's interesting. I won't get on my soapbox, but... Um, we have been using generative AI since before everyone was talking about ChatGPT. And what I think we've lost a little bit with some of the sensationalism of AI is how it can be used for good, how it can be used ethically and for benefit. And this is a good example. So a tool that we use is Writer. And one of the ways that we use it is as we just discussed, all of the kind of inclusive language terms that we spoke about are embedded and we train it using those. So if anyone says something that could be harmful, exclusionary, it tells you what the alternative is, why not to say it, and what to use instead. And another really nice thing is it plugs in with Figma too. So it just shows that as well as training large language models on our tone and voice, on our brand style guide, there's ways that we can use them to help scale inclusivity too. And hopefully, if you are all here and you've chosen to come to a talk on content design, you're pretty curious people, which we love to see. And we are in a luckier space than ever that we have so many great books out there now, much more than when I started on content design and strategy. We may or may not have some writers in the room who may or may not have generously given me a 20% off code, which I may or may not share later. <laughs> but yeah, there's plenty of reading. And if books aren't your thing, Rachel McConnell, who wrote a book called Why You Need a Content Design Team and How to Build One, which is great for just sliding on your boss's desk, by the way, she has now created a really reasonably priced training module specifically on content design for design teams, which is worth checking out. But what would the best outcome of this be? So we've spoken about the systematic issue, right? Content designers are thinly spread. They're context switching. They're doing heroic work, but my goodness, they could be doing even more heroic work if they weren't having to juggle five, 10 projects at a time. So what great would look like 
is if we went away and started to build business cases for why we need more content designers. And don't worry, I've got some little cognitive tricks to help you do just that. So how do you convince your boss you need a content designer? Well, you could use confirmation bias where you convince them it's their idea. <laughs> hmm? So you could say, remember how you said Asia was our biggest growth market? I think there's a real opportunity for localization and content strategy here. Or everyone loves to talk about efficiency, right? So you could say, you know how we really want to be more efficient in our time to market. I know what would save us time. I reckon we could reduce approvals by 40% with a set of agreed content patterns. Hmm? <laughs> or loss aversion. You could highlight what they're missing out on that. Bosses love that. So you could say to them, hey, boss, did you see that the VP of design at Figma tweeted that one of the biggest transformations for Figma was the addition of UX writing? Everything's better with them. Hmm? Hmm? Or I could do some of the hard work for you, and you could just slide on over the article and say, check this article out on how changing the button copy for one of their forms saved a huge travel company $12 million. I reckon we could reduce our top three complaints with some support from a UX writer. Or finally, decision fatigue. We know these people are busy, busy, busy people. So you can do some of the hard work for them. Everyone loves AI. So you could say, hey, I know we've been talking a lot about AI. I think bringing in a conversational designer to help train the large language model to be aligned with our brand voice could be hugely beneficial. Here are some examples I put together of the responsibilities they could have and the value of the role. And I hope that has given you some food for thought on how to work with content designers and a few tasty takeaways for you. So I hope that we are all aligned now that writing is design. It's intentional, it's problem solving. <laughs> Can never. It just couldn't, right? It couldn't. And the pretzel just adds a little something to it, you know? This is a big one. AI does not replace the need for good writers. It never will. I'm not going to get on my soapbox, but I have seen so many tools, so many methods come and go where I've been told, we won't need writers anymore. Yet here we are. Here we are. What you do is far more valuable, but what we can think about is how AI can be an enabler for us, not a replacement. Part of the reason it doesn't do that is because language is much more than just word choices. It's a system for meaning, inclusivity, understanding, and that takes thought, that takes human empathy, that takes people just like you in this room. And words people matter. They really, really matter. Now go hug or hire them. Thank you. <laughs>